What, what made you first interested in motorsport? Oh, I was uh, 15, 16 years old in New Zealand and I was, well my dad took me along to a street race and I quite enjoyed it, watching cars racing against each other. And then I, uh, the particular bunch of friends I had were all quite keen on fast cars, so we all finished up buying various cars from Ford Prefix to Ford Zephyrs to Minis, and we started developing and modifying them. That's when I got the first interest in it. Did you ever compete yourself? Uh, embarrassing, yes. <laughs> I proved I wasn't a top driver. I'm a better engineer than a driver. Yeah. Uh, I first raced a, a very heavily modified Ford Prefect E93A. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So what was your first job in motorsport then? Uh, my first wish was to be an architect, right. but being a young lad in my hometown Dunedin, I didn't take school too seriously and my parents said that was it, I had to go and get a job. So my second choice was engineering and I was lucky to get into a company who did automotive engineering and through them, and I look back now and I'm very grateful for them, they allowed me to actually, in my own time in the evenings and weekends, to tinker with engines. No, you know, my mate's engines, there was no guarantee from me but I would be fiddling with them and developing them and occasionally one would go bang but generally they were pretty quick and the, my mates were very happy though and it was cost price mm -hmm. so that's actually what got me so you were learning well yes yeah with your friends yeah and it helped the company to build up a little motorsport division okay. so so that's in new zealand then yes yeah dunedin new zealand yeah. what brought you to the uk then uh i moved from my hometown Dunedin to the biggest city Auckland where there's more motorsport. Uh, difficult move because I had to give up friends and I was just turned 21 and I was still passionate about the motorsport so I thought I'm not going to learn much more staying in my hometown so I moved to Auckland. Didn't know anyone apart from the company I was starting to work for, I met the two bosses. Uh, performance Developments Limited, and it was a high performance tuning shop, but they also prepared and raced cars for serious racing. A Formula 5000 car and a Allen Mann Escort. Oh, wow. So uh, that was like fantastic for me. Um, then I spent three years there. Then I was helping a, a guy who I met at the Auckland Car Club, uh, David Oxton, and he was the New Zealand Formula Ford champion which for him was a prize to the UK for the World Cup. So he asked me if I'd like to join him, which obviously again, I, phew, I can't miss this opportunity to come to Europe or to England where names like Cosworth and that, Alan Mann were big names in motorsport. So I said to my two bosses, I'm off for two years, I'll be back. And I've never been back, so. You've worked with lots of people in the motorsport industry. Is there anyone who particularly stands out that's helped you achieve your success with the West Surrey Racing? Uh, that's a tricky one. Um, yes, I mean, building up relationship with sponsors, uh, individual people have helped open doors to get jobs and that, because you, you come from 12,000 miles away. In my early days, it was sometimes difficult. I knew and sort of believed what I could do, but it's conveying that to other people. So there's a couple of people helped open doors there, but also um, now more latter, it's uh, important we build up relationships with sponsors, because um, it's not only the results on track we look for, it's building up a brand with a sponsor or a manufacturer. When you arrived in the UK, I was led to believe that you did some work with Ron Dennis and you worked with BMW regards the pro cars, was there any BMW involvement before that time? Yes, when I first arrived, uh, I, was, I was helping my friend with the Formula Ford uh, Championship. Then I actually had a short-term job with uh, race engine building. Uh, then I had the opportunity to uh, go to the Works March F2 team, and they were running Works BMW Formula 2 engines. So that was my first involvement. And uh, 
it was great because I was also uh, through a guy working for Motorsport News, Murray Taylor, he introduced me to some BMW people from Munich. And one of them who I'll never forget was Paul Roche, okay. who was one of their top engine developers, who sadly passed away recently. But uh, I struck up a good relationship with him because of my interest in race engines and his passion for developing the BMW motorsport engines. So that was my first involvement with BMW, so it was 1975. And when did you get involved with the pro cars? Uh, I had a short uh, two years with an American team doing F2, uh, Fred Opert Racing. Uh, then I was offered a position to move to Project 4 with Ron Dennis. So I took that because I'd been travelling around living in a suitcase for years and I decided time to settle down a little bit. So where I was living in Shepparton, it was close to Woking. So. Uh, I started with Ron, we ran two F2 marches with Works BMW engines again. But the end of that year, uh, Ron had done some deal with BMW. We were going to assemble the Pro Car BMW M1 Coupes to race in the Pro Car Championship. So that was a, a really interesting project. Uh, I think we built 23 or 24 of them. Uh, fantastic cars in those times. It was the sort of supercar of the day. Uh, we just finished, got the last one out the door and then Ron come along and said, can you build one more for us? I said, well, we all said, we've had enough, you know, we're 18 hour days we were doing. <laughs> and uh, then we finished up, uh, Ron said it's one for us to run. So, oh, okay. He still wouldn't tell me the driver. So we built another car, got it up and running. Then we went to Silverstone for a test and helicopter landed and out hopped Mr. Nicky Lauder. Oh, okay. So we got a bit of interest again then. It was a challenge then? Yes, yeah, so we did the Pro Car Championship with Philip Morris backing and uh, we won the championship. So that was another big involvement and I've met a lot more people from motorsport in Munich. Okay. You worked with Nicky Lauder in the Pro Cars and then you worked later with Hans Stuck. Were there many differences between the two drivers? Yes, chalk and cheese, both very quick drivers, uh, totally different methods of debriefing, <laughs> totally different methods of approach, but the answer was the same, both very quick. And what I'll never forget is that the 79 race with Nicky at the support race of Monaco F1, we won the race with the pro car, and in 1980 we won it again with Stuckey okay. driving the BMW pro car. So we won both support races. Um, and that was on a Saturday and I'd fly home Saturday night or Sunday morning and my friends would say, well, why don't you stay for the Grand Prix? I said, I'd sooner watch it on telly in the local pub then than be there on the day. So we'd done our work, had a successful weekend. So yes, that was another involvement with BMW. Are there any other great drivers who stood out over the years? Um, I know it's very there's several, there's so many, cause, there? yeah, there's F3 and then there's uh, touring cars. Uh, F3 we won the championship five times, so you've got to have good drivers for that, which was Jonathan Palmer, yeah, Ayrton Senna, Mauricio Guzelman, Mika Hakan and Rubens Barrichello. All top, top drivers. Yes, yeah. Um, so it's a training ground. Uh, we ran a Philip Morris Junior driver program for several years and that was our um, one of our jobs was to not only supply the drivers with a, a good car but to train the drivers because they're on the ladder up towards Formula One. Yeah. Uh, so those guys are good and there's other ones in between um, who just didn't quite have the lucky brakes. Uh, then in touring cars again, super touring days, Tom Christensen, mm -hmm. fantastic guy, I mean eight, nine times Le Mans winner. Uh, and currently we've got three good drivers in our team this year with the BMW 125i and uh, we've got Colin back on board which is very good. We've worked with him for many years so that fell into place very easily. Uh, we've got Rob now for Rob Collard for seven, eight years consecutive um, driving BMW so he's part of the family. And um, we've got Andrew joined us this year, Andrew Jordan, 
who's doing a great job because he's come from front wheel drive touring cars into rear wheel drive BMW. And he's won a race already this year. So he's doing doing well. Yeah. yeah. Um, that that move from Formula Three to touring cars, how did that come about? Um, when we first started, we ran um, our own team. We ran Ralt cars. Then we switched to Reynards for a short period only when Ron Taranac stopped producing F3. Uh, Ron Taranac, the owner of Ralt Cars. Um, I tried to persuade him to build another new one, but he said he is retiring, so fair enough. So we switched to Reynard, mm, okay car, but needed a lot of work. And then suddenly the car to have was a Delara, the Italian made F3, and to give them their credit, it was a fantastic car out the box. So some of the challenges went from developing a car, because in engineering mind, you want to develop a car and make it better. We struggled to make a Delara better. So then I had an invite um, by Paul Radisic to go and watch a BTCC round at Brands Hatch. So I went down, had a look, and he introduced me to Ford Motor Company. And um, I was unbeknown to me, they were looking for a new team to run their super touring program. So Paul asked me if I was interested, and I said, oh, this is a big jump up for us. He said, if you're good at what you're doing, you'll be good. So I thought, this is a new challenge. So we accepted it, and um, we've been in touring cars ever since. All the big budgets in super tours, do you think that helped from an engineering point of view? Do you think that moved the sport forward or were the teams just getting cleverer interpreting the regulations? It was, uh, um, it was a fantastic formula, but it had to stop because of the cost. The end of the day, um, the BTCC as it is now is just as good a racing as then, if not better, at a fifth of the cost. So it's, but going back to the super tour, and it was fantastic for engineers because you could use your brains and you could develop. And a lot of the money went on development. We'd be out testing two days a week, right with the same cars as the race cars. So it was a, a lot of work to prepare them every time, developing every race weekend. So from that side, it was great. But from a manufacturer's side, it was a lot of money for what was a national championship. I was thinking with Formula One and WRC, the developments often end up in road cars. Was that the case as well with Super Tours? Oh, those there was definitely um, carry over development and the cost of the BTC then and Super Touring days was still cheap compared to Formula One or World Rally. Um, it's, yes, there is a carryover with um, engineering, you know, with some of the components that help develop a road car. Um, I had a soft spot for the E30 and the E36 Super Tourers. Did you have any particular favourites other than the Hondas that you ran? We ran a Super Touring Ford Mondeo. That was a challenge with the V6 engine. I probably cause someone to spend a lot of money because I read the rules and it's finding the grey areas within the rules and we found something with the rules then and um, it was a challenge, Cosworth built the engine and it was certainly a, open to can of worms as far as Super Touring regs went so I was quite proud in a way that we'd found something from us that opened up, you know, it made uh, an average engine into a pretty good engine. But, as I said earlier, it, it was just becoming too expensive. I uh, heard that the Mondeos were meant to have cost in the region of a million pounds. It wouldn't surprise me because what was done to them was unbelievable, but, but the rules allowed it. So if the rules allow it, if you've got the backing, you will do it, trying to find that unfair advantage. And that's the good thing with the current regulations now. Everything is very tight and it makes it harder, but it also contains the cost. But the racing is still very good because there's 32 cars on the grid, right. 11 different makes. And for example, the last race meeting at Alton Park, there was 23 cars within one second in qualifying. 
So we can't complain about it. Um, it's a fantastic set of rules. Sometimes it's frustrating for design engineers because you can't change too much. There's certain parameters you can play with, which obviously we do. And there's certain key areas which we concentrate on. Um, the new Dunlop tyres are quite tricky, so we've got on top of them, we think, and a couple of other teams have, but there's still some teams struggling to understand. You know, it's black and round, it's a Dunlop tyre, it looks easy, but it's quite tricky to understand how it works. Does it come down then to the qualifying? Um, other than the BMW's better at qualifying? No, because the BMW is very good over a race distance, um, that the qualifying is a little bit more difficult for us because the tyre is harder, so to generate the temperature. Um, but the regulations are the regulations and we just have to learn to adapt to it and look at the end of each race is where we score the points. There's only one point for pole position, but there's you know, 20 points for winning a race. After the Super Tours, you moved on to what the 90, and that was about 2007. Is that the first BMW yes. saloon car that you've, you've been a part with? Yes, that was the first time, and uh, we'd flown to Munich, and um, we were very fortunate with one of our sponsors, RAC, that they supported us to purchase the, and we bought two kits. We thought the best way to learn is don't buy the car built up, buy it as a kit car and then assemble it ourselves so we learn how it all works, comes together, comes apart. And it was fantastic for a manufacturer to provide a, a kit car to go racing with at FIA level. Every nut, every bolt, every washer was there in bags, numbered up, named up. All in German, I might say, so we had a bit of trouble translating at times. So it took us one or two weeks longer to assemble the cars. But as a production customer car, they were great. Did it start life with you as a five-speed at each pattern gearbox? No, we within the regulations for the BTCC, you could run the production car that came, the production gearbox that came with the, sorry, not production, production but modified to go racing or you could choose an optional six-speed sequential so we went down that route but there's a penalty with that was 30 kilos of weight extra so we figured that hurt us so for the following year uh, 2008 we invested heavily we bought four or five five-speed gearboxes prop shafts bell housings a lot 50 grand exercise. I was going to say, would they be carbon props and things like that? Or they... No, it was just a steel yeah, prop. But it was a big investment to do it. But it was our view was to prove that 30 kilos was too big a penalty for having six speed. Wow, okay. And at the end of the year, we presented all the data to TOCA, the BTCC scrutineers. Mm -hmm. And for the following year, we switched back to six speed sequential with a 10 kilo penalty. Okay. So, and that we then went on to win the 2009 championship. Is that the first time you've worked with Colin Turkington? No, we'd worked with Colin. Um, we started with Colin with the front wheel drive MG in 2002, when we ran a, a sub team, Team Atomic Kitten. And then Colin showed his potential then, he's only 19. Uh, we then brought him in to be in the Works MG team. So um, we've known Colin a long time. <laughs> how, how did you get on? Is that the first time you won with Colin? We got him back in in 06 yeah. into the MG and then Colin stayed with us when we switched to the BMW 07. Well, that, that was his first championship in 09? Yes. Yeah. Um, I believe you made some wildcard appearances in the WTCC as well. Yes, 2010, um, RAC had a change of marketing directors and he decided to invest their money in the football club. Um, so we were lost without a title sponsor. So um, we'd raised enough money from various sponsors to do five rounds of world. Uh, we still ran in the BTCC. 
um, but we did five rounds of World and with Colin and that was fantastic to go against all the works teams to tracks we'd never been to. We struggled a bit in Portugal, but by the time we got to Brands Hatch second reading, we knew where we were going around Brands. Colin knew his way, and we had a great weekend. Won the independent side of it and finished second. Um, then we went on to Bruno. We'd never been there. We'd been there with an A1 GP car, so can't compare data. And uh, we qualified, I think, from memory, third on the grid or second on the grid. Rob Collard was in the team then? Rob was on the British side, not okay. the world, yeah. We just ran the one car doing world. Because also then we had to switch to Yokohama tyres, not Dunlop. Uh, but then we were deemed to be too quick okay. for a privateer, so the organisers of the world championship um, took us out of being a privateer team. But we weren't a works team, so we were a team from nowhere. We were in no man's land. <laughs> no man's land, yeah. So we were too quick and we had it out with the organiser. Um, why? And he just said, all the teams are complaining you're too fast. And I had to say that we have a very good driver, a very good team, very good engineers. I said, the others are too slow. Yeah. We're following the rules. We're fo we've got an FIA car built to FIA standards, regulations, we're following the World Touring Car regulations, we pass scrutineer every time, we're doing our job properly, the others, that didn't take that too well. so we had a bit of a running, but, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, we, it was, then we went on to Japan in the wet and we won the race, second on the road, then we inherited the win. Okay. Then you did Macau as well. Yes, Macau was an eye-opener. Well, I'd been many times with Formula 3, but to run a touring car around there was a different story. And Colin, had, you know, his eyes were popping out of his head. He could not believe this narrow street circuit. You get up to 140 mile an hour and no runoff areas. So he used his head and he finished eighth, I think, just keeping it on the road, being careful. Obviously, with BMW and Macau, there's some history, isn't there? Well? Yes, yep, yep. Then you had eBay join you as a sponsor. Yes, yes. They um, again, we've got to be. We're very grateful to eBay for uh, f supporting us to enable us to build the uh, the BMW 125 IM Sport. You ran the 320s originally. Yes, we ran. Um, we used the 320 SI as a guinea pig to run the turbocharged engine. Okay. So 2012. We've been running the 320 SI, normally aspirated, with the engines built in Munich Motorsport. Um, but then when the regulations were changing to NGTC, we worked out the best way was put a turbocharged BMW engine into the 3 Series and run it. It was the same engine but turbocharged. So then we engaged Neil Brown Engineering to do that for us. Uh, and then we'd done a season with turbochargers, so we're learning. And then the next year, then we built the, um, designed and built the 125i. That was quite a challenge then, I'm sure. Yes, to get three cars out and up and running ready for round one was uh, not an easy task. In BTCC, being at the, one of the only rear wheel drive teams, has that been a challenge over the years? A big challenge. <laughs> um, <coughs> we were the first team to go rear wheel drive. Then another guy, another driver, set up to run a car rear wheel drive. Um, but there was a few, the initial NGTC was designed as front wheel drive. And we just said, would you, if you want a good brand name in there like BMW, you need to change the rules to allow rear wheel drive. Mm -hmm. So the rules were changed, but unfortunately the first year in 2013, we struggled a bit. We won five races, but we struggled a bit because the regs didn't, fully allow rear wheel drive to be that competitive. So then um, the organisers realised that, you know, very good having BMW brand there, that the regs were changed more to help a rear wheel drive car. Um, and it can be tricky for the scrutineers to try and balance the performance, but as a spectacle, it's great having front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, because they all have advantages, disadvantages. 
So we're very happy as long as we've not got too many disadvantages. And at the moment, you know, we're very happy with the way things are going because we've now, um, for 2017, changed to the new BMW latest technology with the B48 engine, okay. which that... is designed as a two litre turbocharged production engine. How has that worked out over the years? Has it been a challenge? It's been great. We've finished three cars, four meetings. We've finished 12 out of 12 races. And, um, well, sorry, Colin didn't finish round one race one, but that was a, another driver deciding to attack him. So nothing to do with the car or engine. Uh, and it's proving to be, we're still developing it, or Neil Brown Engineering are developing it. And it's a great little engine because it's actually designed as a two litre turbo. And that makes it easier to within the regs, because there's still the same set of regulations which must be followed, and the potential is good. So we're, we're not pushing it to its limit yet, because it's a new engine, but we're gradually creeping up to it. After doing so much with BMW over the years, has becoming Team BMW a natural progression, or was it a landmark for WSR? Um, it's a major milestone for us. We've been uh, working with BMW and running BMWs for nine years. This is the tenth year, and the BTCC is a good uh, platform to promote a product. And um, the key people at BMW UK have seen that, and um, especially the M Performance brand for this year. Um, so that's one of the big things is to push the M product, and that's where trying to help them you know, to promote that product. Yeah, looking at the 2017 grid, who looks like the main challenges for Team BMW currently? All other cars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it is it is a very competitive championship this year. 32 cars on the grid. And it's, as people say, the cream rises to the top. And hopefully we'll be there at the end. We've, you know, it, it's to win the BTCC or to win any championship is um, a lot of homework done and the preparation um, from the drivers themselves, their own mental, physical preparation to our engineers, our technicians, the whole package right down to hospitality, um, the office girls doing all the hotel bookings, to everything runs smoothly is takes a lot of time and people. There's two or three other teams um, that we, you know, we keep a close eye on, and obviously they keep a close eye on us. Um, team by, team dynamics do a great job year after year, similar to how we do. Um, Speedworks for Tom Ingram are doing a great job this year. Um, you get Adam Morgan, you get. There's a, several others who you have to keep a close eye on. And uh, this other young lad, Ash Sutton, he's yeah, very talented, so we're keeping an eye on him. So it's a matter about focus on your own car, your own drivers, and develop your own car and do the best you can, because every day the weather changes or whatever, the different tyre compounds we have to run now, the control tyre, the soft tyre, the hard tyre. It's that management of all that is where we spend a lot of time. And you also have comp further complications like you have to use the soft tyre in certain amount of times during the year. And you're only allowed, you can't always choose race three. So you have to work out your strategy. And that's where we spend quite a bit of time sitting with the engineers um, but I've always said over the years, there's four ingredients to go racing. And you can win individual races with one or two of those four ingredients missing. But to win a championship, you need, first of all, a very good car. You need a good team behind you, like the technicians. You need a good driver and you need a good engine. Yeah. So we feel we've got that package this year. Yeah. The BMW 125i is a very good car. The new B48 engine's very good engine. We've got good, three good drivers this year. 
which might give us headaches later in the year, and we've got a good bunch of guys working for us. So the ingredients is all there. There's a bit of luck comes in. AJ's had a, Andrew's had a couple of bad races. Colin's had a couple of bad ones. And so far up till now, Rob is the only driver, Rob Collard, to finish in the points every race out of 32 cars. So that's um, a very good for the guys downstairs. The car's been 100% reliable. Um, and you have a bit of internal battle between the guys on each car. My car's better than yours. and But we do oversee all the engineering and everyone gets equal treatment. Um, and the best man wins at the end of the year. Okay. Looking forward during the year, what circuits do you think BMW will be most competitive at? Uh, coming up to Croft this weekend, it should be a good one, but with the new tyres again, we're a bit nervous. So we just have to see, and the weather, the way it is at the moment, we're not quite sure. Um, Croft, we should be good. Knock Hill, we should be good. But again, we've proven this year, we've won at Thruxton, and it's always one of our bogey tracks. So you sit down, is it the extra power from the new engine? But it's not much more power, it's the torque, the pulling power of the new engine. Very strong torque. Um, we've won at Donington, it's never been one of our favourite tracks. So at the moment, you know, we've been on the podium, one of the drivers, or two of the drivers, at every race meeting. So if you've got a car that can be competitive at every round, every meeting, then you should be looking good, because the goal is to... Um, finish the races and rack up points because at the end of the year that's when it counts so the the pressure comes on when we get towards Silverstone and Brands Hatch at the end of the year. Okay. You, you told me earlier about the engine are there any other developments you're allowed to tell me about? Um, we are continually playing with geometries because of these new tyres this year. Uh, we go to what we call a four poster rig once pre-season. This year we went for two days because of the new tyre construction. And as we said earlier, they're black and round, but there's an art to how a tyre works and your damper settings to suit the springs, to suit the roll bars. You've got roll centres, you've got anti-dive, you've got anti-squat, you've got anti-pitch, you've got lots of permutations which you can adjust on these cars. And it's getting that package right for the weekend on that track surface, on that ambient temperature. It's fortunately with good engineers and computers, we have keep an accurate log of everything year after year. So we can go back and look at Croft 2016, 2015, 2014 to see if there's a set pattern there that you need to do for that particular track surface. That's great, Dick. Thanks very much for your time.